Gentleman yields back, Chair. Thanks, the gentleman. Gentleman from Texas is recognized for questions. Yeah, I just, I just have a few questions. Um, I'd just like to ask each uh, of the panelists, uh, how many people do you think are in the United States right now uh, illegally? So, Mr. Roy, the, it's impossible to say, but I can tell you that for, for, for a good 20-year period from the early 2000s, uh, until about two years ago, the number that was often quoted by media types was 11 million. Um, they now, uh, the, the numbers that I hear now are consistently between 20 and 40 million illegally in the country. How many, how many people, and now I'll, I'll, I'll allow Mr. Raskin to answer. So the illegal, that, that was sort of what we sort of generally refer to as illegally present. How many, in, in general, how many people here who are non-citizens legally plus illegally, do you know? Non-citizens is around 50 million. You got 22 million? Oh, okay. He, the number I just was given by staff is 22 million. I think On the what, illegal number? No, that's the... That's the, that's, I think that's the legal foreign uh, uh, residents. Do you know Mr. Raskin? Yeah, but, but I thought it was generally around 20 million who were lawful non-citizens in different categories, mostly permanent resident green card holders. And the number I've seen kicked around for uh, undocumented is something like 10 or 12 million. Yeah, I mean, the reason I ask is because I've, I've seen wildly varying yeah. numbers. Um, Various studies. I mean, MIT has a study uh, they did with Yale or somebody. I can't remember. It was a joint study. Then there was some other studies that have showed the numbers, and they vary wildly. My point of asking is bifurcating the questions that are presented by the legislation, right, into should we find out who is here and whether they are citizens or not, and how to do that? Is it surveys? Is it via the census question? And then the second question, of course, is then what to do about that vis-a-vis -vis apportionment and the constitution, constitutional questions and legal questions that flow from that. So on the first question, um, what I wanted to say, because it was posited earlier, and I wanted Mr. Raskin and Mr. Biggs can answer the question for the for good of everybody, about whether or not uh, the um, court, in responding to President Trump and, uh, I guess, Commerce Secretary Ross's uh, uh, efforts, on the question uh, was um, uh, whether that said that Congress couldn't act. I thought it was. I thought it was speaking uh, directly to the executive branch's actions as opposed to just Congress. But I'd, I'd like both of you to respond to that, Mr. Raskin. You start, Mr. Mr. Big. Yeah, but, but I read it the same way, Mr. Roy. Um, but sec here's what Section Two of the Fourteenth says. Representatives shall be apportioned among the several states according their to their respective numbers, counting the whole number of persons in each state, excluding Indians not taxed. Um, so in defining the whole number of persons, the court has been emphatic that that means the whole number of persons in the plain meaning sense and not the whole number of voters or citizens or so, so again, that, that to me gets to the second part of the question. The first, in this legislation, right, we're posing two pieces to it. One is whether we ask. Do we just simply want to know? Uh, and we put that on the question and say, okay, are you a citizen or not? And then get that information from 330 million or whatever kids, you know, whatever, you know, people responding. And we get all that information and we figure out, okay, are you a citizen or are you not a citizen? Are you legally here or are you not legally here? It strikes me that that is just a basic function of government, that we should do that. Now, there's questions that are raised in opposition to that about whether that would scare people and they're not going to, you know, all, all the things, all the political questions. Yeah. But I just want to kind of bifurcate the questions because the argument, which is <clears throat> debatable about the 14th Amendment interpretation and how it would apply, what the court would do or not, um, it, that's one question. The first question that I just kind of want to make sure I understand is. With respect to the court's um, uh, opinion vis-a-vis -vis Trump, Ross, et al. in 2020 and the census, I read that to mean that was talking about their executive action on that Congress. It, they left open whether Congress could do it or not, or maybe even explicitly said Congress could do it. I haven't read the opinion yeah, in a yeah, while. They, Mr. Mr. Roy, yeah. they specifically said Congress 
can ask right. okay. citizenship question. Couldn't remember if it was open or explicit. So my, my point being, if Congress, if we believe arguments notwithstanding, debate on the floor, that it is in the interest of the country to ask the question and just say, are you a citizen or not? Let's collect that information. Now let's do something with it. Now maybe that doing something with it might be seem nefarious to others and some on different issues or whatever. But it seems to me a just basic, you know, um, obligation on our part to say that, yeah, the federal government ought to know the people who are in this country. Are you here? Are you a citizen? Are you here legally? Um, you know, and so forth. And then the policy prescription should flow from that. Again, I understand the argument will be that people are here illegally. They don't want to fill out the forms. They're not going to say they're here. So then you're going to say they're undercounting. So you've got people who are here uh, who aren't done, you know, don't, don't have papers. They don't want to answer the question. I get all those arguments. But I'm just saying as a prudential matter as a nation, shouldn't we know who's here? And shouldn't we do that without just guessing? I think that's my question. Either one, yeah, oh, I, Mr. Well, no, but I think you've analyzed it correctly. I think you've got the arguments right. Um, but you're just addressing the first point, right. that this would be um, optional to do um, and arguably constitutional to do. Um, and there might be equities on both sides, but appended to it is a, a clearly unconstitutional provision. Well, and, and if, go I, ahead, Mr. if I can just respond to that, uh, I think it's far <laughs> less clearly unconstitutional than, than my colleague asserts. Oh, so what you're talking about, you're talking about the second? Yeah, we're talking the about question? the apportionment, because yeah. he, okay. he, he, he um, there is no mandate um, in any of the canon of law that's interpreted this that is requiring. Will the gentleman pause for one second? Because I want to address that question yeah. separately. But do we agree it is constitutional, lawful, Congress can do it. It's a prudential question. Should we or should we not put a question on the census to determine whether or not you're a citizen or not? It's just a question of policy for us. So I want to separate those questions about whether it's constitutional or not. And then another question is, if we pass this legislation that has the two components to it, you shall ask the question, and then when you get that, you shall apportion based on citizenship, right? That's effectively what the bill says, right? That if the court were to strike down the second part, would that necessarily strike down the first part? No, there's a severability clause. That, right. I, but I, I, I think it's important for the clause. body to know that. Yeah. So we pass the legislation. You put that forward. You have the first component. Should we know? Great. That's a good question. We can debate that policy. Second question is, is then should it apply for apportionment? Should that, I mean, should that mandate on apportionment then survive constitutional scrutiny? Yeah, and, and, and so then I think that then now begs that question on whether it would survive constitutional scrutiny. Now, gentlemen, please proceed with yeah, your and, thoughts and then Mr. And, Raskin yours, which you've already said the, about Mr. section 14. Mr. Raskin and I have a strong disagreement on the constitutionality. He quotes a portion of um, uh, Section 2 of the 14th Amendment, but doesn't quote all of it. Because when you go to the, this, the back end of, of the, that same section, you'll see that there's a delineation in specific language that talks, with at least regard to the Electoral College, that apportionment can be lost um, because of disqualification of, of electors or voters. So that becomes an interesting dynamic to me. Um, but I would also ass assert that our bill uh, is consistent with my reading, at least certainly from dicta in Evanwall, that kind of gets to a different interpretation of whole. Um, even in that front section, you, you, you're not talking total. They, that becomes the real language, it's the total number. That's what they are asserting. And I'm asserting that this bill does not affect um, certainly the states. And, so but my, my question that I'd ask Mr. Raskin in, um, What's the what is what's the limiting principle? Like, is there one? To to what? To the question of whether mm -hmm. it's a genuine question for my friend is is what is the what would be the limiting principle on who is counted? So well, well the, the census has said they don't count people who are you know tourists from France who are in town. You've got to be living in the country. Right, and the, but is there a uh, length of time that you know? And and so my my point is though. So this 
Yeah, well, do, well, domicile, as you know, is defined as physical presence with intention to remain. And maybe there's some grayness around the margins on that, but basically we know people who are physically present and intend to remain. There's, and uh, this is shady for me in terms of my recollection, but I remember certain aspects of, of, the, of the history of this has also to do with not just physical presence, but allegiance and questions involving that. And so whether or not you're here and have allegiance to the United States or, you know, that those questions are relevant. And certainly we acknowledge that Congress, like in, in terms of interpreting the question, I mean, Congress has had to deal with figuring out the number of representatives that we have and, you know, make decisions all the time. I mean, it's, so it's one person, one vote, but it's 750,000 as effective as 112,000 as it was at one point in time. I just made that number up, but whatever it was at some point mathematically. But my point is just, it, it, Clearly, there is room for congressional and executive interpretation and application, right, of what, in fact, it means to be here and be a person counted and define that, right? And, there's, and, and clearly, in the past, we've asked questions of citizenship, like, from what, 1830 to 1950 or something, something like that. So I, I guess my point is um, I, I just I don't know that it's absolute that uh, the assertion on the constitutional question but my point would be, if Congress believes we should do it, we have divisions on that question. If Congress believes that we should do it, I don't see the problem in passing forward something that we believe is, um, especially if you can argue, if you believe it's clearly unconstitutional, then you have an obligation to vote no. I, I, absolutely. But if you think that there's a legitimate constitutional argument, that you think that, that you could say that, yeah, I think you can count them under my reading of the Constitution and application of it, and we, we should at least get the information, Send it to the court, or send it to the court. It gets litigated, the court gets it. Whatever, wherever they come down on the question, then we would just debate whether we amend the Constitution in, 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 in the absence of that. But is that, I mean, roughly how you gentlemen see it? Go That's ahead, pretty Russell. much how I see it. Yeah. When, when, when Mr. Biggs said, you know, that there's another provision in the 14th Sorry. Amendment uh, which allows for reduction of the congressional delegation, that's true. That's uh, that's if there's disenfranchisement of at, at that point it was the, the male African American population. Then you could reduce the congressional districts by a proportionate amount. But again, that's written in the Constitution. So you know, I, I take your basic point, which is you want to say if you divide these two parts of the, of the legislation, the, the first one could be voted on as a matter of policy. And of course, we have just a fundamental disagreement about whether that makes any sense to do it and why we would be do doing it. I think it's section two that gives the explanation for why it's being done, because they do want to use what's basically an unconstitutional formula for uh, apportioning congressional districts. One that I think, and I appreciate, I know you are a man of principle, Mr. Roy, but I think your state would probably be hurt more than almost any other state in the union by this. I, I, think, we, I, I think we would mm. potentially lose a number of seats. Yes, yeah. what those are, the general lady posited seven seats, I think, or six, six seats uh, as a, po a possible suggestion, yeah. which is four and a half million people, which tells me that we have a firm recognition of how many people are here who are not, who, who are uh, undocumented and or uh, uh, documented and not citizens, that, that it is a very large number. Uh, sure, yeah, of course. So, so I think it's really important because we keep hearing you talk, we keep hearing you talk about undocumented. I said both. Yeah, but, but those, that, that number includes documented. Right, I said both. Yeah, and I think it's, yeah, I know, but I, th I think it's really clear that we recognize that this impacts uh, everybody who is here and residing regardless of status of documentation. And, so, and, and that, that, that's really important to acknowledge, that, that this is a sledgehammer approach to an issue. If you have this issue, well, I think you can take it up in a way that the, Mr. Raskin has re, re, noted. Well, Reclaiming my time is, um, yeah, I've been saying both documented and undocumented. Uh, it is, it, it's questions the numbers. Right, we have again wildly varying estimates on the undocumented population. Certainly, a lot more than we do the documented uh, non-citizen population, uh, which which has a massive impact uh, in a number of different directions on that. Uh, my only point is to say is that we're if we're assuming four and a half million in Texas, roughly, uh, which is what the the number would would reflect if we're saying talking about six members of Congress, roughly, um, then we're assuming a very very large number. And I'm just I'm just I'm just glad to acknowledge the numbers that we're talking about. 
The last question on this is, I just wanted to raise the issue on the, on the legal immigration issue, because that's positive a lot. Um, I, but I, I just wanted to kind of clarify it. Is it. I've seen a significant number of studies that suggest that there's about roughly 50, 51 million um, uh, foreign-born uh, individuals in the United States which reflects 16-ish percent of the population, which puts it at the highest percentage we've ever had in our uh, history in terms of calculating it. It's higher than the early 20th century when we had the explosion of immigration in the late, 19, uh, uh, late 19th century, early 20th century. And currently, legally, to the best of the numbers that I have provided, uh, and I know uh, both of you are, are, are uh, you know, well-informed individuals. Obviously, Mr. Biggs has a lot of knowledge on the board of the Arizona and, and uh, committees of jurisdiction. But we've been running at roughly about a million people a year with some dips. I mean, you know, in 20, because of COVID in 21, there was a fall off in the 700,000 range, 740, back up to 22 and a million at a million. All of the teens was over a million a year. And I just wanted to, just for the purpose of the record, at least acknowledge whatever the percentages are in terms of applicants, our country remains a massive, uh, uh, a massively large door of individuals coming into the United States. If you're, if you're still talking about a million a year legally on top of or, or separate from the population who's coming in through other channels, legally, illegally, et cetera. Is that, would you agree with that, Mr. Biggs? Yeah, uh, more so than virtually all other countries combined every year, we, let, we allow legal migration. Uh, and, and, and I just want to make one, I do think it's rich um, when, when the, it's an, uh, with irony, when people claim that the language saying that this is unconstitutional is clear, as clear as it can be, but then refuses to use statutory language, even terms of art, on the illegal aliens. I, just, I find that's rich with irony. I really do. Uh, because, I mean, even Sting understands you have legal aliens and illegal aliens, and that's why in his song, Englishman in New York, he actually uses the term, actually correctly, the term of art, the statutory term. I just had to raise this just a little cron. Mr. Raskin, you wanted to jump in. Yeah, well, I, yeah. I, again, I, I agree with my friend from Texas um, so much, but I guess I just celebrate that fact. I mean, this is I'm the not, greatest country in the bad. world. Of course everybody wants right. to come here. I mean, you know, Tom Paine, when he came over from the UK, he fell in love with the promise of America. He said this land, if it lives up to its values, will be an asylum to humanity. And I not an insane asylum. I appreciate you know, like, that from my friend yeah. from Maryland. I would, just, yeah. I would say that yeah. we can agree on that point. But all I'm trying to do is establish for the record, for the average yeah. listener, the average American, that we're, we're going about a million a year on top of our current population, which is roughly 50 million foreign-born, the highest percentage in history. You can, we can say good, bad, how are we teaching, how, we, you know, how, how do people adopt yeah. and you know, build our country? Like, how do we have unity as a country? There, these are all questions that we should be wrestling with as Americans. I'm just saying it's a very big number. If you per especially when you one add more in parole and I would love, I'd love to get your thoughts on this. I mean, I have in my office frequently people from the hotel industry, people from the construction industry, retail, saying we need people, we need more sure. workers in the country. The hotels, we, we, we're, we all we're hear looking from that. for workers. Yeah, yeah. I, I, I would, I would argue we should also stop paying people not to work, but that's a different debate for a different day. All I yeah. really wanted to do is say here is that, well, I mean, the gentleman can can look down, but we 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 have a massive welfare state. And as Milton Friedman famously said, he'd love to have wide open borders if you don't have a welfare state. So we, we do have $34.5 trillion of debt and all the things that flow from that, and we do have problems we've got to deal with. All I want to do here, because all we're talking about is citizenship and census, is establish that we're talking about a question to know whether you're a citizen and establish that we are bringing into this country roughly a million people a year, and we have 50.x million foreign born. So hardly a closed door, hardly a hey, you know, you're not welcome. It's more of a question of trying to figure out how are we, how are we managing that? How are we dealing with that? Um, and, uh, and I'll make only one other point is that with respect to Texas is we have, um, we're a donor state still with respect to transportation dollars, which was the example used before uh, in terms of tax dollars versus uh, roads received. Um, and, uh, and, and, you know, the 10th biggest economy in the world, uh, I think, you know, the idea that apportionment is all about 
printing money and then doling it out, I think is a mistake. I think, because that's what we're doing. We're not, it's not like we're responsibly doing something to figure out how to, we're literally just printing money and mortgaging the future to then dole it out to states based on apportionment. But with that, I'll yield back for the interest of time. Gentleman yields back. Chair, thanks. The gentleman, gentleman from Massachusetts, recognized. Uh, Mr. Chairman, all I want to do here is end this hearing. Um, I mean, 